On this first anniversary of the attack on Charlie Hebdo, and less than two months after the ISIS attack on Paris that killed 130 people, the French capital today again under a terror alert. A man carrying a knife attempted to enter a Paris police station earlier today, reportedly yelling Allah Akbar. He was shot dead by police. He was wearing a vest. It turned out to be with fake explosives. And it had a piece of paper with the ISIS flag. His identity has not yet been confirmed. This all comes at a time when the ISIS threat looms larger than ever. The Syrian conflict has led to a flood of migrants to Europe. Iran today is accusing Saudi Arabia of an air attack on its embassy in Yemen, where Iran and Saudi Arabia have been fighting a proxy war. Tension between Tehran and Riyadh already at a boiling point. So what does this all mean for the U.S. as we choose a new president? Joining me now for an exclusive interview, former Secretary of Defense and former CIA Director Leon Panetta. His book, Worthy Fights, is now out in paperback. Mr. Secretary, welcome again. Nice to be with you, Anne. Good to be with you. Uh, first, let me ask you about Republican attacks. Uh, we have seen a lot of Republican criticism in the campaign on foreign policy. First of all, foreign policy as an issue in this campaign. Uh, there's been a lot written, a lot said about the Syrian conflict that's led to the flood of, of migrants in Europe. Uh, you write in Worthy Fights, in particular, that the president's decision, the Obama administration's decision, uh, which led to potentially an, a prolonging of the Assad regime, involved, first of all, withdrawing too quickly from Iraq. You write that the White House was so eager to rid itself of Iraq that it was willing to withdraw rather than lock in arrangements that would preserve our influence. Aren't the Republicans right about a precipitous withdrawal from Iraq? Well, look, I, I think we, we live in a dangerous world. And I think uh, national security as a result of that uh, is front and center and should be front and center because uh, we've got a number of threats that we're dealing with across the world. Uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of issues that uh, can be raised during a campaign, some right, some wrong. But the bottom line that I'd like to hear from both Republican candidates as well as Democratic candidates is how do we confront these challenges? How do we deal with them in a way that will fulfill the president's mission, which is to defeat ISIS? That's something we haven't heard. Well, in speaking about ISIS, ISIS also filled a vacuum in Syria. You write in Worthy Fight that the president vacillated by failing to respond to Assad crossing Obama's red line on chemical weapons, that this sent the wrong message to the world, that uh, there was a weakness in the United States. Is that a legitimate issue, not only for President Obama, but for Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? Well, I think, uh, I, I think the reality is that, uh, that in dealing with uh, these very tough issues in the Middle East, uh, that it's not always it's not always easy, obviously, to uh, to come up with easy answers. But at the same time, I thought a particular concern that I had is that once the commander in chief draws a red line and says that uh, uh, that we are not going to allow uh, Syria to uh, conduct uh, chemical. Uh, warfare, that once that line is drawn, whether you agree or disagree with that line, once it's drawn and once that line is crossed, uh, that the commander in chief has a responsibility to act. Uh, and I think by not acting, I think it sent uh, the wrong kind of message uh, to, uh, to the Middle East and to our, both our allies and to our enemies out there. Uh, that uh, America was not prepared to stand by its word. I think that was, that was a mistake. It's a mistake that we are still paying a price for in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. They certainly did not listen to us when we pleaded with them not to kill the Shia cleric just this past week. The, the danger I see right now is that uh, in, in many ways there is a, a vacuum uh, in the Middle East as we confront ISIS, uh, an, an enemy that clearly has engaged in acts of war and that threatens our security. I think ISIS is a clear and present danger to the security of this country. Uh, I think it is very important for us uh, as, as the United States to provide leadership in bringing those traditional allies back together again, to bringing Saudi Arabia and UAE and Egypt, Israel and others back into a coalition so that we can confront not only ISIS, but also the influence from Iran. I think that is a necessary step that needs to be taken. 
Did we miss a key opportunity early on in this administration to arm the Syrian rebels and try to counter Assad and not prevent the vacuum that ISIS then filled in Syria? I thought it was important. Uh, I mean, obviously, look, Syria is, a, is, is chaos. Uh, Iran's involved. We had a number of opposition groups around. We have Assad involved. We now have the Russians involved. But we have the Turks. It's worse chaos now I than mean, it was it is, when it you incredible. all took over. It is incredible chaos. Uh, and it's, uh, it's tough to try to figure out just exactly how we approach that. But the key, f frankly, is that we have to be able to confront ISIS. ISIS is the main threat. ISIS controls territory in Syria. ISIS controls territory in Iraq. It is very important for us, through our special forces, through our advisors, and the president at least has the basic elements in place that we need. What needs to be done is to intensify those efforts so that we regain those territories so that ISIS does not have uh, the kind of territory where they can train and then conduct attacks on this country. That's something we need to intensify if we're going to be able to do what the president said, which is to defeat ISIS. Is it still possible? I think it is possible. I think, uh, I, I think that it's very important for us to uh, increase our air attacks, to be able to deploy special forces, to provide the trainers and advisors, and to build the coalition, the ground troops we need from uh, our Arab friends there so that we can provide an overall military strategy which will in fact fulfill the mission that the president has defined for this country. The president has said we have to defeat ISIS. I think we need a military strategy that will do that job. Boots on the ground? I think, you know, the, the fact is we, we do have boots on the ground with special forces, with trainers and advisors. I, I think we ought to be very clear with the American people that people who are in those positions have to engage in combat because they have to defend themselves in those positions. We ought to be honest about the risks that are involved. We ought to be honest about the costs that are involved. But the fact is, if we want to protect this country from a potential ISIS attack, and, and mark my words, I think ISIS has the potential to conduct a Paris type attack in this country. And because of that capability, because of that clear and present danger, I think we have a responsibility to do everything we can to defeat that enemy. You think that they are that operational? I think they're that operational. I think we we saw what they did in Paris. We saw what happened in San Bernardino. We know that they are in touch with a, a, a number of lone, potential lone wolves in this country. The FBI has made that clear. Uh, I don't think we ought to underestimate uh, the potential for ISIS to conduct another attack in this country. And that's the concern. We've got to deal with that danger. It is. We don't have time to kind of sit by and hope that somehow these issues will resolve themselves. We have got to make sure that we do everything necessary to protect this country. North Korea, just this week, another nuclear test. Now, it's been discounted by the White House and other experts that it was a hydrogen bomb, but e even though uh, it wasn't most likely a hydrogen bomb, it was a nuclear weapon uh, by this untested young leader who is clearly pushing headlong ahead with both missile and, and nuclear program development. Why isn't China doing more to restrain North Korea and why haven't we pressured China more? We were talking about uh, threats in the world um, and clearly ISIS, the Middle East, Russia, China, North Korea, um, the threat of cyber attacks, we are living in a very dangerous world. North Korea, by virtue of, these, of this test they just conducted, whether it was a hydrogen bomb or not, the fact that they conducted a nuclear test tells us how dangerous they are. This is a, this is a country that is a rogue nation. Uh, they have a very unpredictable leader, and yet they now have nuclear arms. Uh, our approach has always been through deterrence, try to make clear that uh, if they try to do anything, uh, that we can confront them uh, in war and beat them in war, uh, to try to contain them, but to also bring pressure on China. I do think that more pressure needs to be brought on China to play a very important role here in trying to control what North Korea is doing. They're the ones that have the largest influence in North Korea. Uh, they're the ones that have to be able to uh, ensure that North Korea does not do something reckless uh, as we worry about uh, in North Korea. But I think the key there is, yes, deterrence, 
containment, sanctions, but also pressuring China to put as much pressure as they can on North Korea to, uh, to abide by international rules. They're an outlaw nation right now, and that's what, what is fearful uh, in that part of the world. We have described, you have described a world in crisis everywhere we, everywhere we look. Who is best qualified to be commander in chief as we elect a new president? You know, I've said the next president of the United States has two principal responsibilities. One is to break the gridlock in this town because I think one of the greatest threats to national security is the dysfunction in Washington. So the ability to govern, the ability to bring both parties together in order to govern, that is a huge responsibility for the next president. Secondly, they have to be a world leader. He or she has to be a world leader uh, that can deal with all of these threats that we just discussed. So it is extremely important that whoever is elected president of the United States have the ability to govern, but also have the ability to provide world leadership. My view is that uh, Hillary Clinton probably has uh, the best credentials in terms of those two areas that I discussed. But clearly, other candidates on the Republican side have to show that they are willing to address those two issues as well. Now, you were a Republican when you started out in public life. Uh, you even served in the Nixon administration. So yeah. uh, although you have been part of Clinton world and part of the, the Democratic Party for many, many years, are you officially endorsing her? Uh, I've endorsed uh, Hillary Clinton, and uh, I've, I've also helped provide advice on defense and foreign policy issues. Uh, I, I know her. I work with her. Uh, I think... Uh, that what this country needs at a very dangerous time is responsible leadership in the real world, not a fantasy world, but in the real world. And she is somebody who has that experience. Uh, and for that reason, that's why I support her. You support her, but all of these problems we've just talked about got worse on her watch, as well as on your watch. The growth of ISIS, the Syrian civil war, the withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, so why is she qualified to be commander in chief? I think she's qualified to be commander-in-chief because she understands the challenges that are there. She understands the world we live in. She understands the complications of it. Of course, you know, uh, look, uh, going back to Republican administrations as well as Democratic administrations, there is a responsibility for both the good things that happen as well as the bad things that happen. But in the end, the real question is, does someone have the ability to be able to deal with other world leaders, to be able to represent our national security interests in dealing with those countries, and has the credibility to be able to engage in that kind of world. And that is critical at a time when we're facing the kind of threats we're facing now. Now today, a new report, an IG report, an Inspector General's report out of the State Department is slamming the State Department's initial handling of uh, outside inquiries into the private server, the Hillary Clinton server. What about the private server and the lack of judgment that has been alleged at having conducted a business officially only on a private server without also using State Department, uh, State Department emails? Well, you know, look, as, as you know, Andrea, I'm, I am not somebody who's done the email thing. I didn't do emails in, uh, as CIA director, and I didn't do it as Secretary of Defense. Um, I thought it was important to deal with people on an individual basis. But clearly, people deal in emails. Clearly, people deal in, in that kind of communication. I think it is important that when you're dealing with sensitive matters that you have to abide by rules here in terms of how you do that. And she's admitted uh, you know, the problems that uh, she's encountered in that. Uh, I think she's been able to explain it. Uh, look, the American people are not going to vote for president based on an email situation. I think the American people are going to vote for somebody based on their ability to provide leadership in this country. Now, Donald Trump has been going after not only Hillary Clinton, but Bill Clinton now, saying that he is fair game as a surrogate for his wife for his past indiscretions. Do you agree, fair game? Yeah, in the world of politics, uh, there are no lines anymore in terms of what candidates say, particularly with, with Trump and the things that uh, he's been saying. And you were White House Chief of candidate. Staff during that period. I've, uh, you know, I've been a Chief of Staff, uh, have served uh, presidents of the United States. Uh, I, know, uh, I know the challenges that uh, are involved in that job. Uh, I really do think 
that it would help the American people and help all of us if more of these candidates, instead of, of going after personal attacks, could really talk about the substance of the challenge. But in this case, do you think Donald space. Trump has a point that it's fair game if she's going to make women's issues an issue and if he is a surrogate for her, is it fair game to go after Hillary Clinton as well as Bill Clinton for his past record? You know what? I'd like to hear from Donald Trump a little bit of the substance of what the hell he's talking about. Uh, you know, he's made a lot of comments about uh, uh, about how easy it is to deal with ISIS, how easy it is to deal with a lot of the challenges that are out there. But I haven't heard the substance behind it. I think that's what we ought to be hearing more about. Uh, you know, personal issues, other issues. I, I know campaigns are going to get involved in those kinds of debates. But from the per perspective of the American people, I think they need to hear what kind of substance, what kind of details is a president going to actually provide as president of the United States. That's something we're not getting enough of. Now, one person who's not running for president, but uh, yesterday expressed his regrets for having decided not to run is Joe Biden. Let me play that for you. I regret it every day, but I it was the right decision for my family and for me. And uh, um, and I plan on staying deeply involved. And uh, um, it's uh, and we've got two good candidates. You know Joe Biden and yeah. served with him for so long. Uh, did he make the right decision? You know what. I, Joe Biden's a good friend, uh, and I think a good guy, and somebody who has been dedicated to public service uh, all of his life. Uh, I'm sure he would have loved to have been president of the United States and run for that job. But for all of the challenges that he had to confront, particularly with the loss of his son, uh, I think Joe made the right decision. Uh, and, and hopefully will continue to benefit from uh, his leadership because he really is committed to trying to do the right thing for this country. Now, you're here in Washington because you're going to be testifying to the Benghazi, Benghazi Select Committee tomorrow. You've already testified to other committees, but to this committee. And the, there's a new movie coming out, 13 Hours, and it's about to be released. It is accusing uh, the CIA operatives on the ground of being ordered to stand down and not go to the rescue in time. And uh, the suggestion is that if not for that, order to stand down that Chris Stevens and the others might have been saved. First of all, you were at the Pentagon at the time, I believe. Was, was there any order to stand down uh, that you know of? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, it, I'm sure there are going to be movies and books, and uh, there'll be all kinds of theories that will be presented. But uh, from, from my experience and from what, what uh, you know, the role that I played as Secretary of Defense, uh, there was never any order to stand down. On the contrary, the whole effort was to do everything possible to try to save lives. There's also a report, several reports, that the Pentagon made an offer of a rescue effort, military effort, to the State Department, and that someone, uh, the suggestion is Hillary Clinton, said, no thanks, we don't need the help, or stand down, or stand back. Was there any effort by the Pentagon to intervene that the State Department rejected, and would she have even been in the role? I'm, I'm not aware of any such effort at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, after meeting with the President, uh, I immediately went back, and we made decisions to deploy forces to put them in place to be able to go in and provide help uh, to those involved. Uh, and we, in fact, put forces in place. The problem was that attack ended quickly, uh, and because of time and distance, we never had a chance to get there. Um, this is a tragic event. It's tragic in a number of ways, but most importantly, it's tragic because uh, it's now become a political football that uh, unfortunately I think doesn't do service to all of those that were committed to trying to protect lives. Former Secretary Leon Panetta, great to see you, sir. Nice to be with you. Thank you very much. And the book is Worthy Fights, now out in paperback. Thank you.